I'm, I've be, become the ultimate bag lady, right? Everywhere you go, they give you bags. It's like, what am I going to do with them? But we often find things to put in them, so I'm always toting them around. I want to really thank the Japanese American National Museum for hosting this event. Actually, um, it, back in 2004, with um, the launch of the first Masarai Mystery, Summer of the Big Bachi, it was held here across the way in the pavilion. And it was quite a scene. Um, we had magicians, we had people play Japanese flute, and um, we also, of course, had the typical Japanese store prizes, which included a 20-pound bag of rice. <laughs> and to this day, I still remember that the late Art Ito won it. <laughs> so um, unfortunately, there's no rice today. So I'm sorry about that. But a few of you will get a little bit of sweetness today. Um, but again, thanks to Elizabeth Lim. And um, I want to posthumously thank um, Karen Higa, um, who really encouraged the museum to have an event for me, and just all the volunteers. I know many of you are here, as well as the leadership. So thank you so much um, for your support of Masarai. So um, Hiroshima Boy, the seventh and last one. First. I want to ask this question, is are there people who haven't read the Masarai Mysteries? You could admit, OK. Let's see. So, um, so I'm, I may um, give you the, the lowdown on him, and, you, and the ones who know about him will, ha will know already. But so uh, my sleuth, Masarai, is a Japanese American gardener, atomic bomb survivor, as well as very reluctant amateur sleuth. And, um, it just so happens my father um, falls in the two of the three categories. I even had these um, cards made, you know, at my first um, mystery convention, and it explained Moss's identity. And I gave it to my dad, and he looked at it and said, "Hey, this is me." <laughs> but um, but I'm saying, Dad, you haven't solved any mysteries. <laughs> it's not about you. But it was definitely inspired by him. So why the seventh? Why did I call the last one Hiroshima Boy? Um, that's a picture of him right there. Um, and it says Isamu Hirahara. And in typical like dad fashion, he writes underneath it, me. You know, it's like, I don't know why he wrote me, but he did. But that particular photo was taken during World War II. So uh, Moss, like my father, was born here in Watsonville, California, um, but taken to Hiroshima when he was a child. And um, uh, sir, was there when the bomb fell on, uh, was dropped on Hiroshima. And then, um, like maybe when he was 18, a couple years afterwards, he came, returned back to his birthplace, California. And that's, that's Moss's tale, too. So that's why um, I knew that, um, you know, in the back of my mind, I knew that this final one had to be about Hiroshima. So the first one, did I say tell you the first one took me 15 years to write and get published? I left that out. A lot of you know this already. That's the first one that came out in 2004. So many of you um, in this room, they, you know me from working at the Rafu Shinpo, the Japanese-American newspaper in this area. And um, so while I was working at the, or before I went to the paper, you know, I would be working at home on this project. And then, you know, once a week I would go drive all the way to UCLA extension, take a novel writing class, shows six pages. And back then we had, remember those dot matrix printers? You know, we had them at the paper, you know. Sometimes I would print them out at the paper, and then I would drive over to UCLA, read, read the pages, and come back. But um, yeah, so it took a while. And then finally, um, it came out. So that was, and you know what? I wasn't necessarily expecting it to become a series. I was kind of thinking, like, it might be nice to revisit these characters. But when we finally were able to sell it, Random House said, no, we want a second book, like, in the following year. And um, so the first book took me how long? You know? And now I had, like, 
a year to write the next one. Plus, I had already agreed to work on a book on the history of the Southern California flower market. Some of you might have that book, A Scent of Flowers. So it was actually less than a year. And so I was really frightened, but I was able to get it done. So, and, and, um, so Gasa Gasa Girl followed that, and Snakeskin Shah Misen was a third. And at that point, I was wondering, is this kind of the end of the series, maybe, you know? But I was thinking, I think there's more. I think Moss has more to say, more to do. And at that point, a lot of people were emailing me and saying, Naomi, you have to come up, you have to take Moss to Seattle, to the Panama Hotel. You know, he needs to go there and solve a mystery or... Go to Missouri. Missouri have the, has the biggest public Japanese style garden. Put, you know, take Moss over there. And I'm like, I can't be sending him. I mean, what's the reasons? Why is he going to all these places? So I said, no, I need kind of like a guide, you know, an arc for his life. And he's an older man, you know, it starts off, he's 69, right? And I was thinking, I need a plan. You know, what do I want to do with him? And because it's such a uh, personal motivation. I wanted to write about a person who's relatively invisible. You know, your gardener on the corner, you don't really look at his face, you don't know anything about him, but it just so happens he may have this fascinating history. So that was my intent. So I, I couldn't let him just fade away. I had to be more intentional. So I started to outline what the, the subsequent mysteries might be but I, and I thought seven is a good number, and if it's in Hiroshima, um, there's echoes of the first where there's flashbacks. So I knew that he physically had to be in Hiroshima, in the last one. And that was very scary because to set a whole book in a foreign country, um, my mother is from Hiroshima, we have relatives. So I would go, I went when I was three, when I was 14, and um, after college, I spent a year in Japan. And my friend George Ribiero, he, we were both in class together in, over there in Tokyo. But other than that, from that time, I had, and that was way back, I hate to even say, but it was in the 1980s, I had not gone back to Japan, and it was like 2000. 12, you know, and um, I was part of a team that went to help with um, uh, the re relief work in Tohoku, and that was my motivation to go back in 2012. Spent some time in Hiroshima, but not much. But I was wondering, oh, you know, can I write, you know, some of our colleagues, there's some mystery writers here, you know, some of our colleagues, they actually try to write from Google Maps, like, you know, like not even go to the actual location. But I was thinking, I have to be there, you know, and, and it has to be more than just a visit with relatives. By the way, I want to, since this is the crowd here at Little Tokyo, how many of you have a relative who's atomic bomb survivor? Oh, okay. How many of you have a relative who was in Hiroshima when the bomb was dropped? So quite a few. How many of you have um, roots in Hiroshima? You know, quite a few. And, and, and people don't realize that actually in terms of Japan, Hiroshima was the one prefecture, the one place the, where most of the immigrants, most people, um, left to go to other places like Latin America. They went through Hawaii to the mainland. And um, the reasons for that are varied. It's kind of the location of where Hiroshima um, is by the sea. Um, it's also, I guess, in the turn of the, what, 19th century, um, or 20th century, rather, um, that um, there was high t exorbitant taxes placed on farmers. And the people in Hiroshima had very small farms. And so just to pay to help their families, a lot of people left Hiroshima. Even the oldest, usually the oldest son would stay put. But in some cases, even the oldest son would go to make their fortune somewhere else and hopefully help people you know, back home. 
And, um, and the leadership was very supportive, the Hiroshima leadership as well. So that's one of the reasons, some of the reasons why so many Japanese Americans, we have our roots in Hiroshima. So anyway, um, so, you know, contrary to popular belief, um, mystery, most mystery writers are not rich, <laughs> including myself. So it's going, well, how can I get money to do this research project? And uh, one person who really helped me was Sharon Yamato. Where's Sharon? She rode her bike over here. She's so healthy. Um, so Sharon um, actually had asked me to write a reference letter for her um, to go uh, to uh, for this um, grant from a group called the Aurora Foundation. They're in Los Angeles. <laughs> And this organization, it's available to any Californian, to any of you here from California, who has like a, a pressing project, an interesting project, a once in a lifetime project that um, requires you to go to Japan. So, um, and um, when I s saw that grant, I was going, I should apply for this myself, you know? And so I did, and, um, and then, uh, the following year, I recommended Jeffrey Chin, you know, the one who wrote, the filmmaker of uh, Little Tokyo Reporter to, to apply for it. He got it as well. But anyway, so with that grant enabled me to fly to Japan and also to, um, to stay there and do research. Yeah, so I was trying to find my way to Peace Boulevard. So, and I, I got there, so. And then, um, so I wanted to stay in a place not like my relatives in the countryside or even one of my cousins has a nice condo <clears throat> near the port. I said I wanted to kind of live like a regular working class person in Hiroshima. So that so through Airbnb, I, and my husband was with me, we stayed in this place that was a six mat, uh, tata, six tatami mat room. And when I opened the door, my husband was so mad at me <laughs> because it was just the small space and there was a little kitchenette to the side. Basically, you know, here you could basically see everything. And um, there was uh, the faucet, you, you had to turn for the, for the tub, you had to turn it to use it for the sink. Uh, <clears throat> it was that type of thing. But, um, but it was in a great location and um, it, but also the, and it had Wi-Fi, had the mobile Wi-Fi, had an air, con okay, so I had to go in, in the middle of, well, the heat of summer in August. So how many of you have, have gone to Japan in August? It's awful, you know, the humidity is like incredible, but it turned out to be a good time for me to go because I, I was able to go to two atomic bomb commemorations, and some of that is worked in this book as well. Um, but uh, yeah, and so the air, because the space was so small, it was, uh, once you turned on the air conditioner, it, everything was cooled down in like five minutes. And we also had a washer, which was really helpful. So <clears throat> the, <laughs> once you get into, and so this was an apartment, um, uh, unit. And oh, this is another thing my husband was really upset about because you know how they have those key boxes? You have, you have to put the code. And um, he put the code was one, two, three, four. <laughs> and we couldn't change it. And he was like, someone, you know, and he's from Boyle Heights. And it's like, someone's going to come in and rob us. You know, it's like, it's okay. It's okay. You know. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so this was uh, Airbnb living in Hiroshima. Um, so it's very close to um, this uh, Nagare Kawadori um, in downtown um, Hiroshima. And so this was taken like in the evening. What, what I found very interesting about this area, it's kind of the red light district in some ways, but You'll find a flower shop next to, you know, like a, a hostess bar next, you know, like these random things. And then you'll see these drunk men like stumbling around, but then there's like the middle-aged woman in a nice dress and high heels, like with a little, you know, so it's, 
it, it was a very interesting kind of neighborhood, and I and I was able to weave some of that into the mystery as well. And oh yeah, this is the third thing my husband was mad about. <laughs> it was like sun, Saturday night, and then there was an intercom, you know, like a car with an intercom, and it says, "Do not drive drunk." In Japanese, like if you are in a car. Do, and you are drunk, do not do this, you know? So there was this announcement, a PA announcement. <laughs> um, and there was just this, um, so the Hiroshima Carp, they didn't really, um, that the baseball team, which was doing super well at the time, um, it didn't work its way into the book, but I still had to go to a baseball game, right? So um, it was a lot of fun. It really interesting. Um, with the, so you could buy beer like outside the stadium, but you can't bring cans in the stadium. So what they would have is at the, as you walked in, they would give you a paper cup. So people were like opening up their beer and like pouring it in the paper cup and then bringing it into the stadium. And um, another thing that was kind of interesting was there was a haunted house, like, in within the Zoom Zoom Stadium for kids. I was going, what is that? Why is there a haunted house? And apparently in Japan, um, they have haunted houses in the summertime because it, uh, they say that it's scary, so it makes you shiver and it cools you down. <laughs> <laughs> so that was interesting. But the, you know, here's some huge, crazy fans and every, every um, team has their own little you know song and every, player has their own little chant. And if you ever go to Japan, I highly recommend you go to a baseball game. Um, and okonomiyaki, I saw someone with the okonomiyaki menu, I think, over there. So there's a new place that opened up, right? Right across the way. So one of um, uh, Hiroshima's soul food is this um, crazy monstrosity here. Um, it, it's, it's, the cabbage is on top of this thin pancake, and it's it's um, you put a lot of different things in it, pork, sliced pork, and other things, and then it's flattened down. It's like a savory kind of pancake. And um, um, a woman who used to work here, Patricia Wakita, she's the one who recommended me. If you're in Hiroshima, go to this place called Lopez to eat okonomiyaki. And he's from Guatemala, but um, he married a woman from Hiroshima, Pat, uh, Patricia and he had got, we were in the same in Japanese language program way back when, so that's how she knew him. And so uh, I, we went, and uh, so there's, uh, this is a secret ingredient in his okonomiyaki, um, jalapeno, you know, things like that. People, it's very, very, Anthony Bourdain, you know, one of his minions has written about him, so he's kind of famous, and, um, so when we went um, and visited, there was a lot of deaf people there. Like, it, it, you know, it's around the square counter kind of thing. And um, it turns out he was a member of a church, and these were some of the parishioners. So he invited me, you want to come to church? I go, OK, sure. So I went to the English language service, and um, there were mostly, uh, most of the attendees were Filipino. So I thought that was so fascinating. I did notice this time around when I've been to Japan that it has been become more multicultural. The like signage is not only in English, but in Korean and in Chinese. And in especially uh, like Hiroshima, there's a lot of Filipinos. And I, I found that super fa uh, fascinating. And that's why, if you read the book, there's a Filipino char Filipina character in the book. And another thing that was interesting were um, people were talking about hikikomori, komori, um, which is um, this this phenomenon that's um, really hit the Japanese American, I mean Japanese, and the and their children. There's a lot of youth who do not want to leave their rooms. They're like not only addicted to the computer or technology, but they cannot interact with people. You know, it's, it's a big national problem. And 
I heard, you know, more than one person kind of share their personal experiences. Like, there's mostly a lot of them are are boys, but their son, you know, and some of them were older, did, did not want to leave the house, and what would what was going to become of them. And, and I had heard that this was a problem anyway, but to hear it from actual parents and to meet actual kids, it, it kind of um, stayed in my brain. So that is an um, important part of Hiroshima Boy, too. Um, you know, what's just so great about um, travel is just this chance encounters. And I was lost, and this gentleman was... Um, you know, helping me, you know, he was an atomic bomb survivor, and I was telling him my story, and, you know, that's, I think, the beauty of travel is to kind of bridge the gap and meeting, you know, people and hearing their stories and sharing, sharing yours as well. Um, oh, okay, so um, when I went to, everyone goes to the Peace Museum, right, when you go to Hiroshima, there were doing some renovations, so some of it was closed down. I had been there before anyway, but what was interesting was um, these are the origami cranes that Obama had folded and um, given to, uh, I guess, the people of Hiroshima. Obama, um, at this particular time, and probably still today, is so popular in Japan. There were, like, books. I think there was even a book, like, Obama's you know, cranes, you know, they, they, there was a lot going on. But, um, yeah, it, I, I think it was so, as you all can remember, um, I think um, the former President Obama was maybe the, the first president, to, U.S. president, to actually visit Hiroshima um, after the bombing. So it was, it was so meaningful to people. Um, this is one of the places I had not gone in the past, but if you ever go to Hiroshima, I know it's very sad, but it was very moving. Um, they have a couple of elementary schools there that kind of function as museums. And this particular one, it was really amazing because they were doing some renovations, so they were removing like a wall or you know the facade of a wall, and then they found all these messages that people had left. It, this particular um, structure was still standing, even after the uh, the bombing. And it was like people, like, have you looked? Have you seen my sister? Have you seen this person? Have you seen that person? And just to see the lettering, you know, that people had left was um, e extremely emotional. So I was glad to have seen that. Um, okay, so this is um, uh, one of two atomic bomb commemorations that I attended. One is on the island of Ninoshima, and I will explain that in a moment. And um, this one was actually in the city of Hiroshima, the main city. And this, you could tell like how hot it was, like this priest, you know, he had, they were giving what, this was eight o'clock in the morning. And it was, I, I think it was 90 degrees and, yeah, every, so they were giving these shibori, these frozen like towels out and giving people water, ice cold water. It was very hot, but um, and I was glad that I went. Although my um, my relative, so my mother's father had been, my grandfather had been in the center, ground ground zero, and of course he was never found. Um, but my cousin was telling me, Naomi, you know. Um, go there, go to the, um, the Peace Museum a day before this whole commemoration. She was kind of saying the commemoration's like a circus. It's too crazy. You know, just go there the night before and, you know, do some more contemplation. You know, that's what she was advising. And I, I understood where she was coming from. Okay. So where... Um, what what became very important in terms of this book, Hiroshima Boy, was this particular island called Ninoshima. Um, in the book, I referred to, as, to it as Ino. Um, I just wanted a fictitious name because my relatives um, 
still have connections to the island, and I didn't want people to think, oh, you you wrote nonfiction. You know, no, this is a mystery. It's fiction. Um, but this island, which is a 15 to 20 minute um, boat ride from um, the port of Ujina, um, it, it's known for its shape. Some people call it mini Mount Fuji. People hike around it. But um, it's also known historically as a place that after the bomb was dropped, um, you know, Hiroshima was flattened, but Ninoshima still had its structures intact. So people like victims like got on rafts and they were going to the island and there was like 10,000 people on this island. Currently, the island has a population of 1,000. So, um, and another thing that's interesting is um, a retirement home for people, I mean, it, m many of them had lost their children in the bomb and the way that Jap Japanese society was very, there's a lot of filial piety. In the old days, you know, the children took care of their parents. And since they had lost their children, there was no like safety net for them. So they started a retirement home here, as well as there was a home orphanage for children. So there were those kind of um, social institutions on the island, which is very interesting. Um, also, what I saw there was oyster spats, um, kaki. Oyster, uh, Hiroshima is also very known for its kaki oysters. But I found out that in the summertime, you don't want to eat oysters there because they could be poisonous. <laughs> so it, it, it's, it, I don't know, it's a certain variety of oysters. But anyway, so these spats are kind of where the baby oysters are being raised. And um, it's a, a downtime for the industry in the summer. And the building to your right is, that's the retirement home. It has a, um, a monument, a Buddhist monument in the front. Um, and, and this is a place that my relatives help uh, operate. Okay, and this was just a morning walk. So I wanted to read a couple of excerpts from the book. Now that I'm giving you more context of what it was like for me to do research, I wanted to let you see like how these things kind of get integrated in, into fiction. Um, so this is, uh, so Moss has to go to Hiroshima. He's now 86 years old. He doesn't want to go back. He hasn't, he went briefly for his wife, for his, when he married his wife, but he really hasn't been back since he was 18 years old, and he's 86 now. So, um, but he goes back, and I hate to tell you this, but his best friend Haruo has died, so he's bringing his best friend's ashes to Ninoshima, not Ino Island, where his, his uh, uh, Haruo's sister lives in a retirement home. So um, Moss is, uh, you know, is jet lagged. He's just really wiped out. And now this is like the day, the, the morning after he arrives. Hampered by, un hampered by interrupted sleep, he was severely annoyed to be awakened by the intense light from the morning sun. The curtains were opaque, and there was no way to reduce the sunlight. Shikataganai, he thought. Nothing can be done about it. His watch read 12 noon, so it was probably only 4 in the morning here in Hiroshima. He could not go back to sleep, so he decided to wander around outside. In the lobby, he traded his slippers for his shoes and waved at the worker behind the desk to open the glass doors. He walked up the concrete road past small oyster production factories covered in corrugated aluminum. Their operation sh seemed shuttered for the summer months. Stacks of threaded white scallop shells resembling giant puka shell necklaces like the ones Mari wore in high school were placed in piles on their side. Plastic tubes that probably were used to connect the shells were packed upright in crates. He had seen at least one man fishing from a cement platform and wondered what kind of fish could be caught in these waters. He himself was a surf fisherman, at least in his prime, 
And he loved the pull of the rod in his hands, the constant fight with the caught fish, a dance of release, and then a quick reeling in. Surprisingly, the surf did not smell as salty as the times he fished the Pacific Ocean from the shores of California. Instead of a polluted brown, the water had a greenish tint. He looked around a makeshift jetty, which housed a small boat with a motor. What was that floating in the water beside it? A red flag? But it seemed attached to something. A knot of seaweed, perhaps? Curious, he walked down to the platform made of giant gigantic uh, bamboo poles, now weathered gray, that had been tied together with wire to planks of wood. The way the red item bobbed in this water was suspect. It certainly was not from the sea. As he got closer, he almost lost his breath. He could make out a head of black hair about two inches under water. He should have immediately gone for help, but the floating body was calling out to him. He broke loose a deteriorating bamboo pole from the jetty and pulled the body toward him. As the body turned in the water, the face, bloated and fleshy, came to the surface. The eyes were closed, but the mouth was open. A small dark fish darted in and out from the lips. The red that Moss had seen from the hill above had been a t-shirt that the floating body was wearing with San Francisco emblazoned across its chest. So Moss finds a body. So that's how the mystery starts. But I, I didn't see anything like that floating. <laughs> um, so this is um, at the Ninoshima boat landing. There's, uh, there was the shrine there. And as well as a, there were a lot of alley cats. My husband, had, you know, now today he's not here, so I could talk. All, all sorts of things about him. But, but he, he's a softie for animals. Um, and he was, of course, we had to feed the, feed the alley cat. We had to go to this little market and buy tuna and da 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 da. And it's like, you know, but it was, it's, but of course, so what happens? The cat is like a major character. <laughs> not, not that particular cat, but a cat becomes a major character in this book. So I'll read this to you and then um, field, I, and then we'll go on. There's a few more slides and then I'll, I'll field questions. So uh, Moss is in um, near the boat, this boat landing. There's a kombini, there's a convenience shop. He, you know, has a, a, he bought a couple of sandwiches, really healthy sandwiches. One is like a, I think a fried pork cutlet sandwich and another is a noodle sandwich, which they really have, you know, yeah, he really needed his carbs. <laughs> so anyway, um, a shriek ran out behind the waiting area. He's in this little air conditioned waiting area. The bully cats were at it again by the Shinto shrine. The tabby cowered in a corner by some long concrete memorial tablets and the edge of a house. The black cat was on its hind legs, snarling and challenging the one-eyed feline to a duel. Moss was not a cat lover, but Haro, his best friend, definitely was. At the flower market where he had worked, Haro had befriended alley cats, especially the most miserable looking ones, plying them with treats that Spoon, his wife, purchased from the market with discount coupons. After he retired, both he and Spoon fed all the stray cats in the neighborhood, much to the consternation of their neighbors. When Haruo got sick with cancer, their attention to homeless animals declined, and soon only a pitiful blind cat, black with, a white, with white paws, remained on their porch. This island tabby, its left eye missing and side marked with a horrific scar, reminded Mas of Haruo. The state of Haruo's damaged face and neck, not to mention a fake eye to replace the lo lost one, were remnants of the bomb, something he could not fully hide, but he nonetheless soldiered on with the greatest optimism. Moss had once d dismissed his friend as being weak, but now more than ever, he realized that to live with hope required the highest level of courage, more courage than he himself could muster. He finished the noodle sandwich, balling up this plastic wrapping in one fist and throwing it in the trash can. He didn't know what kind of business 
uh, Tatsuo, this is someone who worked in the retirement, had with the cranky cashier in the kombini, but it was taking a long time. The cats were at it again, and Moss had had enough. The sun hitting him squarely in the face, he went straight to the right corner of the shrine. Yame nasai, he shouted for the black cat to stop, causing it to leap on a black wall and escape through a side alley. The tabby stayed frozen in place. It was straggly with matted fur and probably hadn't eaten in a few days. Against his better judgment, Moss opened his plastic bag, pulled open the wrap for the fried pork sandwich, and tore a corner piece for the homeless cat. It was famished, judging by the way it gobbled down the bit of bread and meat. All right, Moss said, that's it. But of course, that wasn't it. As he headed back to the air-conditioned waiting room, the cat followed. He closed the glass door, but the cat positioned itself right in front of the doorway, mewing furiously. Ah, shimatta, he thought. Darn it. Here again, a little bit of kindness led to trouble. He opened the door a crack. Go home, he admonished the cat, knowing full well that it had no home to go to. Tatsuo was by the door of his car, his arm raised as a signal that he was ready to go. Yes, yes, Moss bobbed his head and without thinking, picked the cat up by its neck and stuck it in his bag. <laughs> so you have to read this book to find out what happens to the cat. <laughs> um, yeah, so, ni uh, ha, that's so funny. I did a misspelling. I combined the fictional Ino with the ni Ninoshima. So anyway, this is um, in, in the real Inoshima and in Ino Island. Um, so because 10,000 people, uh, uh, victims of the atomic bomb were on this island, of course there were a lot of fatalities, a lot of people dying. So even to this day, like when they're excavating, they're doing, they're trying to build something, they come across bones, you know, and skulls and things like that. So they found uh, quite a few bones in this particular place. It's across the street from the elementary school. So they created a garden to mark it. So, and then I was here very early in the morning. I, I was jet lagged too, you know, and it's bright at four o'clock in the morning. So I'm like walking around like 4.30 in the morning like a crazy woman. But other people were too, and this woman um, was tending the garden, and I was talking to her, and um, she wasn't from this area, but she moved here with her husband, and so she felt like this was her mission to take care of the garden. Um, and <laughs> they had this tool shed, and this was their museum, you know, what to show what had been discovered there, and I found that um, it, it, it was so moss-like in, in some ways. It was like, and I put that tool shed in the book as well. Um, so this is a, a photo. This is the children's home. Um, and I, did, I was able to talk to like the principal of the children's home. And what was kind of interesting was that the, there's a, in the main, where that shrine is, that's the main village of, of Ninoshima. And this children's home is like not, it's not that close. But it seems like the children are separated from the children's home people, you know. And I, I thought that was, it was kind of sad that, you know, they were kind of segregated, you know, like don't interact with, the, you know, those, those kids, you know. So, um, so a part of that I, works its way into the book as well. Um, so yeah, like one of my last days um, in uh, Hiroshima was when in the evening they, you know, people write messages and they float um, the messages down to, um, on, you know, on, on the river here. And um, it was a madhouse. You know, it was a crazy, you know, so they said, well, we can, if you tell us a message, we can write it for you. You know, you have to pay and you will write the message and we'll do it for you. You know, at first, like, it's like, I'm not, I don't want to, I want to do it myself. You know, I don't want someone else to do it. Um, but then I saw the lines. There are these crazy lines. I would have to stand in line for an hour and a half. And then 
I was looking at these messages that people were drawing, and like some kids are doing like anime characters, and it was like, like, hmm, I don't know if this is like the true, you know, spirit of what this day is all about. So, yeah, but it was still really beautiful. <laughs> oh, okay, and so, um, but at this time, are there any any questions? And uh, well, you first start, you talked a little bit about going to Japan and or trying to write a story about a place that you hadn't been. And you know a lot about little Tokyo and Japanese American history and all that. So it's, but I was thinking, did you perhaps think that because Moss hadn't been there for so long that you were in a way honestly looking through it, at it through his eyes in a way? Totally. I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it would be very difficult for me to write um, just from the point of view of someone who lived there their whole lives. Although there are characters like that in the book, so to a certain extent, I had to um, imagine it, you know, from a, a from a homie's point of view. But but certainly, I uh, okay. And oh, this is another reason why I had the crime take place on this island. They have no police there. And um, that was a, another, because it's very closed. Uh, Japanese society is very closed in terms of law enforcement. I mean, you know, you have the local Koban guy, and he's friendly and all. But in terms of, like, someone be getting arrested and what happens to, you know, all that kind of things, it would be very difficult for me to get all the lowdown. And I did talk to a, a reporter, um, a, a journalist who, who told me some things. And, and other people said, oh, I have a, a you know, police officer brother you could talk to. But um, yeah, so I just, it, it felt more comfortable to do it in a place where there wasn't much, you know, the police have to come on the island. But, um, but there was a lot more freedom for me to do it that way as well. Yeah. Any other questions? I too have a writing project that I'm trying to finish where are you? in a year. I'm up here. <laughs> Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> um, so it's I nice to hear. Hi. It's nice to hear that you're able to, you know, write a book in a year. Um, and you just accomplished so many major writing projects in such a short amount of time. And so I was just wondering if you could share some of your writing tips, like how you get yourself to write every day, how you get yourself to write consistently, and yeah. How do you finish your project so quickly? Do you have a deadline, Chris, on your project? Is it self-imposed? Self yeah, and I self -imposed am Self-imposed are like them. the hardest, right? It, the first one took me how long? <laughs> 15 years. Um, I mean, but I kind of mean that sincerely. Um, like once you're in this business of writing and then you're beholding to a, a publisher, an agent, they're expecting something, you know, at X amount of time. So that lights a fire, you know. And, under your oshiri to <laughs> really, you know, uh, produce it. But I think that um, I'm, I'm pretty, I think my years at the newspaper really helped me to honor deadlines. Um, so that constant training, I, I'm, I think most journalists are pretty good about that in, in general when they segue into writing fiction. Um, but I, you have to carve out the time. I know my colleague Adam Phillips is over there too, and you know he he's like works at a corporation, but he would go to his what the lobby of your company like five o'clock in the morning or something. Was that it? Five o'clock in the morning. He tells a really funny story because he would go into the the lobby to write because he couldn't even do it at home. You know, just write right before work. And I guess this homeless woman was like watching him for, right, for over a period of time. And then she like, did she join you at the same table? And then she was started writing. <laughs> so, but I think it's helpful to kind of carve out that time. Like if you have a day job, you go to day job at 10, okay, maybe from, you know, like 7.30 to 9, whatever, for two hours. I think two hours is a good chunk of ch time because usually it takes you an hour to kind of get into it, and then and then you have the the additional hour to really try to get some work done. 
Um, so I would suggest that to, to have a prescribed time period. Another thing for me, what helped me was to get with some other people who are writing something. And like every week or every two weeks, you have X amount of pages to show them. So I think that's another thing that's extremely helpful, you know, to, it can be helpful. But for me now, I'm fairly good at just, I mean, uh, I just have to keep thinking about the next project, you know, there's just, that, that's just my life, you know, so I'm kind of in that, um, that practice of just, so it's not only what I'm working on now, what am I gonna work on next? And in the back of my mind, I have projects I may work like five years from now. So it's, it's a weird, I don't know what it is, but it, it constantly like juggling certain things. And I think it also helps um, to break, like to go on trips sometimes, to go to a place that you're you know researching or writing about. Because you have to get be excited about what you're working on. If you have no passion, it's going to be really tough. And that one conversation with a person, that one cat that you see, you know, it's like something sometimes tangible that you see that makes you excited about what you're working on. Sometimes, so sometimes I think you have to leave that the laptop or your little office to to um, interact with someone to to get you through like that hump. So that can help too. I mean, when I'm really on deadline, I will say I have to write like 1,500 words today, you know, for, for two weeks. I have to write 2,000 words today. I just have to, you know. So that's, some people do it by word count. I don't know if that's helpful. But. Anyone else? Hello. Hi. So I'm only a few chapters into your book. I'm enjoying it. Um, just my first introduction to Moss. I love the character. Just evocative, great. Uh, the introduction, especially seeing your slides, I thought you did a wonderful job of sort of characterizing the archipelago through his eyes mm -hmm. as he sees it. But anyway, and you brought it up briefly, but I don't know if it was Moss or Tatsuo who said something to him about the bodies that every now and then come up through the soil. And I thought that was a wonderful image. So my question is, how do you think the people responded, let's say, you know, as the island, having that type of tragedy happen to them? You know, even though it was 50, 60 years ago or more, how do you think that characterizes them in terms of how you rebound or how that affects your psyche? That is like a really... Fantastic question. And Thank I think you. in some ways, um, you know, I was kind of trying to get at it. I think actually with the whole series um, of Moss books, I mean, that's kind of one of the themes because he's an atomic bomb survivor. And the thing with Moss is that when you look at him, there's nothing wrong with him. You know, he's a short guy, that's about it. But, you know, um, and sometimes, uh, when it looks like nothing's wrong, um, it's kind of harder to, um, because there's no signal. There's no, nothing to tell other people, oh, this, this, you know, about your post-traumatic stress or whatever. You know, so it's something you can contain or hold inside and keep silent about um, your whole life. And, but the, the thing that happens, and this also bleeds into what Elizabeth was saying about the whole incarceration process and the Syrian, you know, there's all these um, parallels and connections. Like, um, I think if you don't share it or if you don't talk about it, it starts to affect your relationships and especially with your most intimate friends. And I think in terms of like a place like Ninoshima and Hiroshima, all of that with the trauma is so known to people and it's commemorated. You can't walk like two blocks without seeing some kind of commem commemoration, you know. This is what was here before the bomb fell, you know. And it's so present in people's, in some ways. And I think sometimes with other, uh, maybe newer generations, they become, in, they're, they're, 
it, it's just so everyday, so pedestrian, that it almost doesn't hit them as much. I know that a challenge for the, the people at the Peace Museum is to um, educate young people, you know, and, and to have them really feel the severity of, of what happened. And I think that um, it's also, like when I went to the commemorations, you know, people are, the little kids are drawing, I mean, there weren't little, little, but high school kids are drawing like anime or manga characters, you know, it's, it, it's, and it, it's of course hard to process when you're that age, but so um, to, to I, I think that um, it's, it's a complicated, it, it, there's all these various layers to it, um, but I do think that the arts is one way that people kind of process. I remember when the tsunami hit Fukushima, um, all these people started writing haiku on Twitter, you know, and, and that was one way for them to kind of express their sorrow and grief. So um, I don't know. I guess that's what I'm trying to do it for myself. But um, it is very palpable. I do think that almost an outsider would feel it even more intensely than someone who's lived there you know, their whole lives. Um, I know your readers are really sad that this, that Moss is, this is his last, his swan song. But I was curious how you feel about that. What, what went through, how was your emotional, what was your emotional state as you were? Finish. You know, it, someone else asked that at the Romans thing, and you know, when he asked it, I started feeling really sad, <laughs> and, and now I'm starting to feel sad again. Um, I, you know, writing it, I, you know, I, I tell people I feel a sense of relief um, that I was able to finish the series because I wanted to finish it like appropriately, and that I was able to go to Hiroshima and write, you know. This is the proper ending from this series, um, but I do I do feel really sad, and um, you know, and I what's helped me is that um, when I get feedback from people, you know, and I think yeah, this is a mystery, it's entertainment, but I think um, th there was one really moving email I got recently where um, they were saying that these three female generations of their family read the Moth series. And sometimes they don't get along, <laughs> but they all read the series. And right now, the matriarch is very ill, and she can't turn the pages of the book, so the mother is reading the Hiroshima boy to her. And when I read that, I go, oh my god, you know? And I think that it's, that's a sad story, but it's very touching. And I think that's how I meant the books to be, you know, not just, oh, here's another mystery, who did it, you know? The, of course, there's that angle to it, but I wanted people to recognize um, themselves or else be introduced to a person like Moss and just um, have compassion and empathy for him, you know? And, and, you know, I think, my husband says I'm not funny, but I think I'm funny. <laughs> He goes, you're not intentionally funny. <laughs> like, but I also to laugh, because I, I feel like there's a lot of humor in the books, too. So p for people to kind of laugh, like, what a crazy community we are, and what a cast of characters, those kind of things. Um, so, you know, those things kind of help. But I just would not want to write, you know, ch you know, chuto hampa. I don't know if you guys, it pretty much means half ass. I don't want to write those, you know, a chuto hampa type book, you know, keep doing it. So I wanted to write a proper, you know, strong book. So I'm, I'm, I feel at peace with it. But I will, okay, so this was, last time I was here, this is two years ago, we talked about the Maserai uh, movie. It's like, what happened with that? It's still, we're still working on it, you know, and I think it does help that I'm still in the Maserai world. Um, now I'm helping to produce this. It's going to be a very small movie. Um, what's interesting is I didn't write the screenplay. It's going to be set in the 1960s. And Moss is in his 30s. And his wife is still alive. She's pregnant. 
And, um, but uh, just to still work with some of the themes that are present in the book and to visit them in this medium is really fun. So I think this is helping um, kind of mitigate some of the pain, right, to do this. And um, I'm also working on a, a new book, um, a historical, it's going to be a th historical thriller. And it's going to feature a Nisei woman in her, in her 20s. And um, she moves from LA to Manzanar to Chicago. So it's going to be set in Chicago. And it's, um, um, call, call, right now the working title is Clark and Division. That's an intersection in Chicago. So um, I don't foresee that one to be a series, but um, I'm really excited to be working on it. So, so there'll be more books for you to read. And I might revisit Moss in like short stories here and there. But, um, but um, yeah, so but thank you so much for having me. We're going to have this. Uh... Thank you to, again to Naomi Hirahara. <laughs> We are very much looking forward to hosting your other future projects. So as Naomi mentioned, we are selling her book right outside in the lobby, and she will be doing signings right outside as well. Thank you so much for coming. We hope to see you again soon.